please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 20 through to 32. Uh, we will be focusing on verses 25 onwards, but just to get that context from last week, we'll read from verse 20 through to 32. And the Word of God says, But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of, one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That is the reading of God's Word. If you have been watching international news over the last couple of months, uh, you would have seen a devastating earthquake that took place in Turkey and Syria. It was an horrific earthquake. It killed um, in excess of uh, 59,000 people in Turkey and Syria. Uh, it was known as the, uh, most or the second most devastating earthquake in Turkey. There was one greater in 526 in Antioch. Uh, if you saw the images, you would have noticed when that earthquake hit and, um, and the tremors afterwards, the buildings had come down. There was dust, there was rubble, uh, and then there was rescuers. They scoured all of the debris, going over it, listening and seeking signs of life. Is there anyone alive? Is there any noise coming from under the rubble? And you, you see the cheers go up as they found people alive. Remarkably, they survived somehow in an air cavity or something. Even 11 days after the strike, people, three people were found alive. It, quite remarkable. But as I looked at the footage, what was stark to me is the difference in reaction as well as the, uh, the person, between those dead and those living. When those dead people were found, those, um, those bodies, they were put into body bags. There was weeping, there was grieving, uh, and, and there was no life. But when they found life, when they heard a knock, when they heard a voice, they would do everything they could to rescue that person. And that person, though perhaps mentally shattered, crying, um, alive, breathing. They're alive. They don't, they're not in the body bag. There was a vast difference between the, the living and the dying. And I think as I looked at the images, it really, at least in my mind, helped me to land the truth that there is an infinite, difference between the spiritually dead in this world and the spiritually alive. There are those who are non-responsive non to the truths of the gospel, to anything godly, to, to actually living godly, and there are those who are exuberant. They are alive in Christ. They, have a, they are seated with him, him in the heavenlies, and they have a transformed life. Why? Because Christ has entered into darkness and bringing light and life to that which was dead and dark. Listen to a number of verses that shows this emerging life out of chaos. John 1, 4. 
In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus affirms this in John 10.10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 5, 21, for, this is the, this, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Jesus goes on and tells us about this life that is received, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death, from the body bag, to life. And Paul teaches this in Ephesians 2, 5. We've seen this in previous sermons. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. If we as God's people are made alive in Christ, then surely it stands to reason to believe that there will be a marked difference between the dead and the living. Just as in Turkey, there was a marked difference, an infinite difference. And so we should expect that among God's people. Where are the signs of life? That's what we wanted to see. That's what God wants to see. Remember, we talked about this last week, didn't we? And as we read just this passage and before this last week, uh, we showed that, um, that w- there, is, there is the world and there are those who chase after the world. And what is their state? Well, their thinking, it's said, is futile. It is self-orientated. It's deceived. It's corrupt. Uh, out of that futility of thinking comes actions that are unholy and impure and the outcome is they are completely separated from God and in judgment forever and then Paul goes on and says but you have not learned Christ like that you've not learned Christ to follow in your former ways you've been raised from the dead therefore take off the grave clothes and live this newness of life in true righteousness and holiness See, the gospel, a right gospel proclaimed, takes seriously holiness in living. A gospel that does not affirm holiness as its fruit is a deficient gospel. Let me say that again. A gospel that does not affirm holiness as its fruit, not its root, is a deficient gospel. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And again, verse 24, he tells us, Because this has happened, now put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. You are a new creation, now put on the new self. Live like that. This is the paradox of the Christian life, isn't it? This is the paradox of what we are, but yet what we have to be. I remember hearing John MacArthur on this, and he put out this question. He said, who lives your Christian life? Who lives your Christian life? You might say, well, the Lord lives my Christian life. Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So you'd be right. You, oh, the, um, Christ lives your Christian life through and, and, and outside out of you. But does that mean now, because that's the case, we live and let God? We, oh, sorry, we, we, we just leave, leave it to God? We rest in God and He just lives our Christian life? No, there is a responsibility, isn't it? Isn't there on us? Because then Paul says, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. So there is a paradox here. Christ lives my Christian life through me, and yet I also live it. I need to beat my body and bring it into subjection. I need to live by faith in Christ and abide in Christ. I need to obey His commandments. 
I need to yield to the Spirit every moment of every day. And as I do this, the Christian life won't happen. Fruit won't be born. So it is 100% Christ as we are compliant to the working of Christ. We don't just simply sit back. No, Christ is living it through us, but we are yielding to that and giving ourselves to it. Faith in Christ brings spiritual life which is confirmed through holy living by the work of God and our willing participation. That's the paradox of the Christian life. We don't do it on our own effort. We do it in the effort Christ gives us, but we do do it. And we do it of our own will, our own diligence. And like any good preacher, Paul, having sort of put it the theological doctrinal statement, you are now alive in Christ, you are a new creation, now live like that, Now, the good preacher will tell us how to live, right? He'll apply, he'll help us apply this truth. And now Paul goes on to tell us five signs of life, five ways we are to live differently from the world. This is what you used to do, now you do this. We could call it five signs of life. Um, I had the audacious plan of actually hitting all five this morning. But as I was going through it, I thought after, after getting through one halfway through my sermon, I thought, I'm going to drive you guys crazy. Um, so we're going to do two, right? Two signs of life, um, more palatable. Um, and, and I want us to know, as we get into these, they, are, they relate to the community. So the way we live actually um, has an impact on the community that we're in. See, holiness is just not mystical escapism. It is living in the right way before the eyes of God and the eyes of others for the service of God and the service of others. It's not just simply piousness, piety. It is actually doing. But also, in, in, in terms of the Christian community, it's also um, that we'll know when we look at these, there is a negative prohibition and there is a positive command. And you can see how... Um, why Paul is doing this, because remember in verses 22 and 24, he says, put off the old self, that's going to be the negative prohibition that we're going to see, and put on the new creation, that's the positive command. All right, so let's have a look at this. We're looking for signs of life. Are we alive in Christ? Are we out of the body bag or are we still in there? Okay, sign one, exchange lying for truth-telling. Lying for truth-telling. Verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Well, that's pretty straightforward. He states that when we come to Christ, we put away falsehood. And instead, we give our efforts, not to falsehood, but to the efforts of truth-telling. We put off the grave clothes of lying and put on the new creation of truth-telling. What is falsehood? What does falsehood mean if we had to put it off? Well, as I said, it's, it's lying. It's deceit. It is to state something that is contrary to fact, spoken with the intent to deceive. It is aimed to distort something. I mean, we have become so good at this, haven't we? There, there are so many shapes and sizes that this takes, not being true, exaggeration, flattery, or just simply straight out untruths. It is to cheat on a test and to claim that you worked hard, that you did the work. You didn't look at your neighbor's um, answer. It is to promise something when you know you cannot deliver, but for some reason, in the moment, you just feel it's expedient to say, I'll be there. I can do that. I promise. Maybe it's to save face. I don't know, but we do it. We're not true to our word. I remember in the US, um, Christy connected with a neighbor, an um, unsaved neighbor, and they were going through the word of God, and did, did I think for a couple of weeks... Uh, And then this lady said, yeah, I'll be there next Friday. Like, just totally, yes, of course. Um, Next Friday comes, not there. Okay, must have just missed, you know, forgotten about it. 
hey, just check in, um, missed you last Friday. Oh, yes, of course, I'll be there this Friday. I was like, just totally blatant, I'll be there. Not there. Okay, third try. And sure enough, she wasn't there. And I was like, I don't know what it is, but maybe she doesn't want to offend us, but she's not true. She's not true. That is deception. Um, it is to say something false to back up a point you're trying to say. Oh, so-and-so believes this, therefore you ought to believe it. And you know they don't. Or so-and-so said this, and you should therefore agree. Because you're, you, you want to force an answer or something. Uh, it is to flatter someone, perhaps because you want them to like you. Um, perhaps because um, you want to be accepted. It is to betray a confidence. Said you wouldn't say it, but you did. You, you shared it with someone. I won't tell a thing. I won't tell a soul. But you go and tell someone. Could be dist- to distort um, how your day's going, what you actually look like on social media. I mean, those, um, those uh, apps that, that make you look so much younger, make you look all the, all the more beautiful, they're lying apps, right? You don't look like that. I don't look like that. Be nice. But it's not true. It's a distortion. And so we live in this falsified world. And then we've got to back up the image, right, with a wonderful life and uh, nothing bad happens at this side of the screen. We've become so accustomed to lying that we just think nothing of it. In fact, we would, know, we would not know what to do if the government started telling the truth. I mean, there would just be there'd no need for opposition. Like, if everyone's just telling the truth. It's all great. We, we, I think the economy, everything would fall apart. No need for security. Everyone's just honest. Now, lying is such a part of the pervading culture, but beloved, it must not pervade us. Falsehood should not represent us. Why? Why should it not? Well, it's commanded for sure. But let me give you a few reasons why it should not. And that is because God hates lying. God hates lying. Proverbs 12, 22 Lion lips are an abomination to the Lord. God is true and he hates lying. Secondly, another reason, because liars go to hell. Liars go to hell. Revelation 21.8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, they're, they're pretty big sins, aren't they? And all liars their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I mean, what does this mean? If I tell a lie, am I I going to hell? Am I destined to hell? No, the point is there are times in our lives where we will fall into sin and lying will be one of those. That's why Paul says, put this off. But there is no possibility that you can look at your life and see a continual flow of lies and get any assurance that you are a Christian destined for heaven. That's what he's saying. If lying means nothing to you, and it's just part and parcel of who you are, then you've seriously got to question your faith and ultimately your destiny. Thirdly, because Lying displays the devil's character, not God's. Jesus speaking to the Jews, um, who the Jews thought he was lying and he thought they thought he was crazy. He said this to them. This was the priest. Uh, John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, lying is not conducive to the character of God. Lying is conducive to the character of Satan, who is a liar. There is no truth in him. But the character of God that you have um, in you is truth, is, is, is righteousness, What did it say? Let God be true and every man a liar. Of Christ it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It never fails. Christ never fails. The Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. And so if 
we have him in us, if we are a new creation in Christ, stands to reason that our character will display his character and that will be truth-telling. Fourth reason, because we are God's holy community. We are God's holy community. Why should that make a difference? Well, Paul, when he says um, that you should not lie, that you should speak the truth, what he's doing, he's actually quoting Zechariah 8.16. Now, you don't need to turn there, but it's interesting context. Zechariah 8.16, before that, for the, verse, for, for the first 15 verse, verses, uh, the prophet outlines who the remnant is as a, as a people of God. They are a chosen remnant, they are a holy remnant, and they are making their way up to Zion, the city of truth. And so he's saying, this is who you are as a remnant of God. You are now together, you're my people under me, the God of truth, making your way up to the, um, the, the, the city of truth. And then the first command Zechariah gives is 1.16. And then he goes on to give further commands. Now, put it back into this context. What has Paul spoken about the church? He has said, you were, chapter 2, dead in your trespasses and sins, been made alive in God by faith. Then he says, you Gentiles, you are outcasts, you've been brought into the people of God, you are a holy temple. Now we are the holy community, and what's the first command he gives to the holy community? The, the ones who have put off self and put off, or put off the old self and put on the new self, it is this that we would speak the truth, that we would speak the truth, that, that truth would characterize the community that we have. So we, as a community, as our neighbors, can expect truth from one another because not only uh, singly are we representing God and His holy character, we are collectively representing God and His holy character. And then he uses another metaphor, and this takes us to our fifth reason, we're not only a holy community, community, but we are members one of another. You know the metaphor, and Paul has already spoken of this. The metaphor is that we are a body. Some are arms, some are legs, some are eyes, some are hands, some are toenails, etc., etc. Um, and Christ is the head. And now, could you imagine how the body would operate if it started to lie to each other? So my eyes, and I, I like soccer, I'm thinking of uh, Micah here, Right? see a soccer ball coming, you go for a kick, but you realize after you kicked it that your, lies, that your eyes have been lying to you and it's a giant rock. You think, oh man, well, what happened? Yeah, the, lie, the eyes lied to the foot. And then if your um, eyes want to lie to the mouth and you see this beautiful burger, you pick it up and it's poison. Or worse still, for some, Brussels sprouts. Right? It'd be a problem. Right? We, we just could not function that way. And so we can't function in our holy community, in our body, if there is any lying, falsehood, deception among us. No, truth telling builds trust and builds us up. Lying breaks trust and breaks us down. John Stott said, true fellowship is built on trust and trust is built on truth. So Paul tells us, first of all, we're looking for signs of new life. In the terrible destruction and rubble of the fall that pervades this world, what are the signs of new life? The first is that we would not give way to falsehood, but we would speak the truth. It's simple. So the question is, have you lied lately? Have you lied lately? Have you flattered, deceived have you given white lies? It's only a white lie. Would you be happy if God gave you a white lie? I don't think so. He's not there to deceive. Are you currently lying now? Are you living a lie? I mean, your wife thinks you're living a certain life and you're not. Or your husband thinks you're living a certain life and you're not. That's a lie. If you're perpetually living like this, the question then becomes, are you assured of your ultimate salvation? But... Lying is a terrible sin that grieves God. And so what should we do with this? Well, like any sin, beloved, we need to repent. We need to ask the Lord to forgive us and to change us to be truthful people. And maybe also, 
What is, why are you lying? What's the motivation for lying? Is it fear of man? Is it the belief that um, you are the sovereign king of your own world? Maybe look at the motivation. Why? Why do you lie? And trust in the Lord. Tell the truth. Um, and ask him to change you to be a truthful person, that that sprout that's coming up of life would flourish and bear fruit. So that's the first sign. Let's look at the second sign. Second sign, sign two, exchange sinful anger for righteous anger. Sinful anger for righteous anger. There is a right way to be angry, and there is a wrong way to be angry. And Paul states this here in verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So, is anger a sin? Well, no. Getting angry uh, in the wrong way at the wrong wrong thing, that is a sin. We know actually God gets angry. It states in the Old Testament a number of places, the anger of the Lord. The anger of the Lord. I mean, this is expressed against sin isn't it we see this seen in the so we see this in the life of the lord jesus christ he goes to the tomb of lazarus and in the shortest verse it says jesus wept what what's jesus weeping over i I believe that he's weeping over sin The, the the destructive nature of sin that brings death and and probably in in and he knows that the joy put before him is to change all of that one day. But, but he's grieved over the nature of sin, the destruction of sin. He, his anger, he's angry when he takes out the whip in the temple for he cannot stand the desecration of his father's house, a house that was to be a place of prayer and worship and not a place of greed and exploitation. I mean, God's holy anger is leveled against sin, isn't it? Therefore, it's leveled against us. I mean, what was in the cup that Jesus did not want to drink? What was in that cup? If it be possible, take this cup from me three times. It was the anger of God, the holy wrath of God leveled at you for your sin, that he was willing to drink to the dregs Hence why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you would not be forsaken by him. Why? Because God is an angry God at sin. We love to think that God is a loving God. But I love what Paul Washer said, something along the lines of, I'll just see, um, yeah, the thing we must fear most is that God is loving. God is loving. I mean, people take some sort of comfort in the fact that God is loving. The thing we must fear most is that God is loving. Why? Because a loving God does not put up with sin. I couldn't imagine a mother being um, just sit there while her son or daughter is abused. No, because she's rightly angry against sin of the one she loves. A loving God is very angry at sin and therefore is very angry at us. And that's why Christ had to die right? See, I think our problem, our problem is that we get angry at the things we shouldn't get angry at, and we don't get angry when we should get angry. John Stott said, there is a great need in the contemporary world for more Christian anger. Whoa, okay. Hold up. We human beings compromise with sin in a way in which God never does. In the fact of of blatant evil, we should be indignant, not tolerant, angry, not apathetic. If God hates sin, his people should hate it too. If evil arouses his anger, it should arouse ours too. And I think we'd all say amen, but just before you say amen, I just wonder... How much of the yielding to temptation that we each individually have comes as a result of us not being indignant at sin? If we were as angry at sin as God was, we would not fall into temptation anywhere near as easily because we would say, no, 
I will not do that. I will not despise God's name and do that sin. Before we get indignant at the sin of others, we need to level that same arrow directly at our own heart. But the question becomes maybe, as we think of righteous anger, how do we know if we are ang- uh, have righteous anger? How do we know if we have righteous anger? There are three things. Uh, this is taken from Uprooting Anger, a book by Robert Jones. And I think they're very helpful. Three things. Firstly, righteous anger is angry at actual sin. Righteous anger is angry at actual, actual sin. It is an anger against the a transgression of God's law. It is not being angry against the infringement of my preference. I cannot come with my, when my rights have been violated or my freedoms removed. Righteous anger is angry at sin. Someone forgets my birthday. It's not a sin. Can't get angry. I'm sure you'd love them to say happy birthday. Someone doesn't like the music. It's a preference. It's not a sin at church. We can't get angry. So is the anger an anger at actual sin? Secondly, righteous anger focuses on God. When we see righteous anger in the Bible, it is a focus on God and his kingdom, his rights, his concerns, not on me, not on my kingdom, not on my rights, not on my concerns. It's motivated by God's name. When someone sins against me and I get angry, is my anger inflamed because it is first an offense against God or an offense against me? So if your child is rude to you and you get angry, are you angry because it is an offense against you or because it is an offense against God. Righteous anger has God as the one who has been offended. If your wife or husband disrespects you, are you angry because they've disrespected you, how dare they, or because they've sinned against God? Massive difference. Jonathan Jonathan Edwards said, we must see sin as infinitely worse as against God than it is against us. I think a lot of our anger is leveled at us and our preferences, our desires not being met. Thirdly, righteous anger is expressed, this is a good one, in a godly way. I've seen many people get angry at the right things, at the right things, at the things that they should get angry, but man... When they get angry, it is in a very unrighteous manner. It's exhibiting an ungodliness. It could be a loss of control of words, of tone, of facial expressions, of pointing, of saying, and then running down the um, hall and slamming the door behind you. There is nothing godly in those expressions. Righteous anger, when done rightly, characterizes God's righteous nature. It is self-controlled, it is humble, it hopes, it praises, it mourns, it rejoices even still, it does use force when necessary. And I'm thinking of Nehemiah chapter 13. The priests had intermarried. Nehemiah goes in there and basically confronts them, curses them, beats them and pulls out their hair. All right. So anyone, guys, the uh, elders will be on to you now. <laughs> Righteous anger, right? Um, No, no, assess. Is your anger righteous? Is it against sin? Or is it it against sin? Is it concerned with God above everyone else? Is it expressed in a righteous manner? Now, if it's not, then we, we better be very aware. We are now treading in very dangerous territory. It's a minefield. When we get angry, it is like a fuse that goes off and destroys everything around it. It is destructive because it leads to other sin. Listen to Friedrich Bonscher regarding how sin operates, anger sin operates. He says, "Of Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savour to the last tasty morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. Or in many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. 
the chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. When we get angry, when we have bitterness, when we chew it over, we're, we're chewing over our own souls. We are eating ourselves literally alive. And you, you, you know this. You've seen this. No wonder Paul says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. What does he mean by that? Sure, if you're in bed and the sun's going down, get up and fix it. But I think the point is, is this, this baby, this is dangerous. Deal with it straight away. Maybe go for a walk, cool down, but then you deal with it straight away because this is a fuse ready to explode and take down everyone around you. And maybe a bigger reason, look at our text, for it says it gives, anger gives the devil an opportunity, a foothold by which to take advantage. We create the foothold to the devil. He comes in and takes a stronghold over our life. Do you know what this, the, the concept of a foothold is? Let me explain by illustration. Uh, on 2nd of June, 1944, this is known as D-Day, uh, there occurred the greatest land invasion ever to take place uh, in, the, in the world for the purpose of driving the Nazis back from France. To do this, like the, um, the whole, um, the whole uh, beachfront was armed by the Nazis, by the Germans. They had 133,000 troops land on the shores of Normandy to what? Establish a foothold to establish a beachhead from which to launch an assault, the greatest assault in all of human history. Within, and that was successful, within four weeks, four weeks of landing and taking the beach, they had, the Allied forces had landed 850,000 men, 148,000 vehicles, and 570,000 tons of supplies which allowed them to push forward and take France. Now, Satan doesn't work that way in a sense. He's not interested in liberation. He's interested in takeover. Not protection, but destruction. And so Paul tells us that anger becomes that beachhead, that foothold to take more and more and more of your life. The devil loves to be near the angry person, to exploit your vulnerabilities toward other sins and wreak havoc in your life, in your marriage, in your family, and in the church. He'll work to get a minor dispute to be a major battle. He will work to make momentary disputes to be this simmering bitterness that will spew out its vengeance. He will keep the momentary, or sorry, the memory of sins and the perceived slights against you in your heart And you'll store them up and even add to them and add even people to them. So you've got this grocery list of wrongs that they've done to you so that then every interaction with them them is now a perceived assault against you. Why? Because he's wanting to destroy you. And how? You've let him land on the shore of your heart through anger and now you've not dealt with it and it is wreaking havoc. Out of self-righteous indignation, you've given yourself over it and Satan abuses it. I mean, isn't this what happened with Cain? God warned Cain. He said, why Why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. We might say Satan is crouching at the door. Its desire, his desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. And what happened? He failed. He murdered his brother. What about Haman and Mordecai? Haman walks past Mordecai. Haman thinks he has got it all together. Mordecai fails to bow to him. Caesar's a slight against him as a sin. He then goes and plots. He gets angry. He says, how dare you? He goes and plots his murder, the murder of Uh, Mordecai, and he is hung on the very noose that he created for Mordecai. Why do we do this? Why do we get angry? Why do we hold on to it? Because I think we've got a high self-importance. 
We are proud. We are, we are egotistical. We are self-sufficient. And Satan exploits these. We give the devil an opportunity. We get angry. And he takes over. How are we to deal with this? The same way we deal with lying. We need to acknowledge it. We need to repent. We need to repent. We need to forgive those who might have done something against us. We need to reconcile. We maybe need to turn the other cheek. Love, it says, covers a multitude of sins. Maybe we think if Jesus Christ died for me, taking upon himself God's wrath, surely I can show grace to another. Maybe we could pray for our enemies. Is there signs of life in the church? Or is there signs of death? Two signs. Are you a truth teller? Is that flourishing in you? Or do you get, and, and uh, do you get righteously anger at the right things? Or do you get anger, angry at the wrong things? Are you alive in Christ? Then if we are, brothers and sisters, we need to put on Christ. We need to always be telling the truth out of the character of God. Humble ourselves before God, submit to him, and we are called not to get angry. Living a holy life is a life our Lord died for and one we must fight for. 100% him and 100% us. And just know the Lord knows our struggles. He knows our confusion. He knows our insecurities. He knows our limitations. Humble ourselves before the Lord. Put off the old self, put on the new. And may the Lord be gracious to us. Lead us back to the cross to see what he died for. Lead us to the empty tomb to see what he conquered. He conquered the sin that is besetting you. He conquered Satan. It's all there and he's given you a life that you can be renewed in him. Come back to him in humility. Identify the sin. Give it over to him and accept his forgiveness. Let us pray. Lord, thank you that Christ has taken all our burdens upon himself. Thank you that he has defeated sin and death and Satan. Uh, they no longer have rule over us. But Lord, we know that holiness, sanctification, uh, it is that paradox. It is the work of Christ in us as we yield to Christ and his work in us. Lord, help us. I, uh, put the x-ray over our heart to identify lies that we believe, lies that we're giving, deception, anger toward anyone. Lord, let us repent, accept forgiveness, and maybe it's to speak to a brother or sister um, about this. Lord, I pray that you would do your work, that you would make us holy people, and there would be signs of life in our body, and that you would build it up for the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.